Hey, I like your shirt. Oh, thanks. No problem. So like, what's your favorite? Oh, hold on just a sec. Um, yeah, so what were you saying? I just wanted to know what your favorite Nirvana song was. Yeah, never mind. Who's Nirvana? Nirvana, oversimplified. Nirvana was a 90s alternative rock band from Seattle, Washington. Their most common lineup included three members, Kurt Cobain, Dave Grohl, and Chris Novoselic. Kurt Cobain sang and played the guitar, Dave Grohl played drums, and Chris Novoselic played the bass. And within a span of six years, this band released a total of three studio albums, eventually becoming one of the most successful bands of all time. But what was so special about Nirvana anyway? Well, to find out, why don't we start at the beginning? We should start a band. No, I'm good. <laughs> well, check this out. I bet you'll change your mind. Eh, sure, whatever. Dude, nice tape. What the? And after that, Chris and Kurt started rehearsing together. Pretty soon, they even had a name for their band. The Sellouts. But for some reason, that name didn't really stick, so they changed it to Skid Row, and then they changed it again to Ted Ed Fred, and again to Pen Cap Chew, and again to Bliss, and then finally, the best name yet, Nirvana. Now you might be thinking to yourself, hmm, with a name like Nirvana, this must be some sort of soft rock group like Steely Dan or Hall & Oates, right? Uh, no. Bleach didn't change much for Nirvana. It was a decent success for their label Sub Pop, but not much more than that. In fact, if Nirvana broke up right after Bleach, few would remember them today. However, Bleach was important because it was just successful enough to give Nirvana traction, but also just unsuccessful enough to make them change everything on their next album. And without going into too much detail, they got rid of this guy for this guy. They got rid of this guy for this guy. And they got rid of these guys for these guys. And one more thing, Cobain would start writing songs that were, quote, poppier and poppier. Now these changes were all big deals. However, the single most important thing about Nirvana's next album would be its first single, Smells Like Teen Spirit. Now, if you think that sounds like a song about unhygienic teenagers, then you'd be wrong. It's actually about, um, uh, t a teen revolution or something like that. Which brings me to an important point, actually. No one knew what the heck Kurt was singing about. You see, oftentimes, Kurt would write his lyrics mere minutes before he sung them. And when asked what the lyrics meant... Well, he would just kind of change his story each time. So when you inevitably find yourself unable to understand what Kurt is saying, just remember that the words probably wouldn't make sense, even if you could. The point, though, is that Smells Like Teen Spirit was Cobain's attempt to write the ultimate pop song. Not only did he succeed, but the result was a miracle. Punk rock was now the biggest genre 
in the world. Believe me when I say the impact of Nevermind cannot be over-exaggerated. Nevermind became a cultural touchstone of the 90s and was nearly omnipresent on the radio. The album managed to infiltrate nearly every corner of society, from being introduced into the Library of Congress to being named one of the best albums of all time. Despite this, Nirvana was overwhelmed. Newfound success nearly caused a breakup so they took a break from touring. Their rest was short-lived, however, because they soon faced an impossible task. Release a sequel to what some would call a perfect record. Now, the story behind Nirvana's third album is a long one that epitomizes the struggle between an artist and their label. As the story goes, Cobain was unsatisfied with the slick recording style of Nevermind and saw a more natural sounding, raw recording. And for this, they hired the infamous engineer, Steve Albini. However, Albini was the last person DGC wanted Nirvana to work with. So what did they do? They went AWOL, with both parties gathering their equipment and heading to the forest of Minnesota for two weeks of secluded recording. Yet, after emerging from their sessions, no one was satisfied. Everyone involved argued constantly about how the recording should sound. In the end, it would be mastering engineer Bob Ludwig who would perform emergency surgery on the record until all parties involved felt the album was good enough for release. In Utero was to be Nirvana's final record. According to Cobain, the album was very impersonal. However, the album actually references his personal life and generally contains feelings of anger towards the music industry. But how did the music industry respond to his final work? In Utero did not disappoint. Despite not selling quite as well, critics loved In Utero. The album garnered numerous perfect to near perfect reviews, with one rather amusing review stating, In Utero is beautiful far more often than it is ugly. Nirvana have wisely neglected to make the unlistenable punk rock nightmare they threaten us with. That's right. In a strange twist of irony, the band that treasured Rebellion has somehow made a record that pleased everyone. The punks were happy, the critics were happy, the masses were happy, and the label was happy. Sadly though, not everyone in Nirvana was happy. Six months after the release of In Utero, Kurt Cobain was found dead at his home in Seattle due to injuries from a gunshot wound to the head. He was 27 at the time of his suicide. Now many theories and conspiracies revolved around Cobain's death. Regardless though, the fact remained, the biggest rock star in the world was dead. Following his death, 
Nirvana disbanded. The former members took different paths. Nova Silic decided to focus on political activism, while Grohl went on to form another band, Foo Fighters. And as for Nirvana's label, well, they did what any reasonable corporation would do in a situation like this. They exploited his estate and milked any remaining IP for profit. Now, at this point, I should probably start talking about the legacy of Nirvana and about how crazy important they were to music, yada, yada, yada. But instead, I'd rather just focus on how you can best listen to their music, because I think that's just more important anyway. To do this, let's figure out what actually makes Nirvana's music unique. I would argue that there are five key things that complete the Nirvana sound. The first one is dynamic shifts of quiet than loud instrumentation. Second, live performances with chronically untuned guitars. Third, guitar solos that imitate the vocal melody. Fourth, Dave Grohl's intense drumming. And fifth, Kurt Cobain's raspy voice. Let's explore some song examples for each one. First, to demonstrate the quiet loud dynamic, we have Penny Royal T. Now, to be honest, there are many songs that contain this dynamic, but for me, this song and this mix particularly epitomize the sound. Next, we have Lithium from the live album From the Money Banks of the Wishka. Two seconds into the song, and you'll hear immediately that Kurt's poor guitar is nowhere near in tune. And if you can't tell, try listening to the studio version first for comparison. Then we have Come As You Are. Here, we want to pay attention to the melody of the song. To do this, try singing along during the first and second verses. And later, when the guitar solo starts, you should be able to sing along to it with the same melody from earlier. Our fourth song is a personal favorite of mine, Scentless Apprentice. Albini recorded the drums on this album perfectly, utilizing a bathroom and 30 different microphones. As you listen, pay attention to the power and purposeful intent behind Dave's drumming. Lastly, we have the 1991 performance of Territorial Pissing on the Jonathan Ross Show. The story here is that in typical punk fashion, Nirvana were doing their best to offend the audience of the show by intentionally changing the song that they were supposed to play to the less radio-friendly song, Territorial Pissing. And in doing his best to piss everyone off, Kurt maxes out the distortion on all the instruments, including his voice. And those are the five songs I recommend to better understand Nirvana. Do you know of some others? Let me know in the comments. All in all, if there is one word that best describes Nirvana, it would be contradiction. For example, their music consisted of both beautifully whispered pop melodies and thunderous, headache-inducing noise fests. Their music was abrasive and vague, and yet their members were loved for being sensitive and relatable. Even Nirvana's lyrics themselves were contradictory. Take, for example, the famous line, a mulatto, an albino, a mosquito, my libido. Truly words to live by. And that, my friends, wraps up my oversimplification of Nirvana. And yeah, I hope this video served as a helpful guide to approaching Nirvana's music. So the next time you're forced to name your favorite Nirvana song, simply push up your glasses and proudly answer, Floyd the Barber. <laughs> Just kidding, that song sucks.